something new this morning, starting a series on the book of Proverbs. I don't think we'll be going through the book verse by verse, but we're going to start at the beginning. And the series is called Walking in Wisdom. The book of Proverbs is a book about wisdom. There's a difference between being smart and being wise. You know, there are a lot of smart people who aren't very wise. We might call them foolish. So there's a difference even between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. So the motto of the book of Proverbs is found in verse 7 of chapter 1, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. People who know more about Hebrew than I do say that the Hebrew words translated knowledge and wisdom have very similar meanings in the book of Proverbs. That's why Proverbs 9.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This morning, I want to answer three questions from Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom. So the first question is, what is wisdom according to the book of Proverbs? Number two, what is the fear of the Lord? And number three, how is the fear of the Lord the beginning of wisdom? But before we get into those three questions, I want to give you a quick introduction to the book of Proverbs. So, the, Prover- the book of Proverbs has more than one author. The main author is Solomon. You look at the first verse, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. So, most of the Proverbs in this book are from King Solomon, but not all of them. Uh, You read of this in this verse as well as in chapter 10, verse 1. Then in chapter 25, verse 1, we're told that King Hezekiah's men copied some of Solomon's Proverbs and included them in this book. Uh, There are some Proverbs from the wise. I don't know exactly who they were, but they're described as the wise. Chapters 22 and 24 There are some Proverbs from Agur in chapter 30 and some Proverbs from Lemuel in chapter 31. But Solomon is the main uh, contributor to the book of Proverbs. The date, we really can't be sure when the book of Proverbs came to be in its final form as we have it today. Certainly after the time of Solomon, perhaps during the reign of Hezekiah, who reigned about 250 years after the reign of Solomon, but it could have been after that. We don't really know, but some of them, as we know, were written during the time of Solomon, and some later on in its final form came many years later. Uh, The genre, what kind of writing is it? Well, it's wisdom literature, and it's written in the form of Hebrew poetry, Uh, The audience doesn't have a specific audience. Obviously, it would be written to people in Judah. uh, But in uh, verses 4 and 5, we get some groups of people that are mainly thought of when these Proverbs were, were written and compiled, put into this book of Proverbs, as well as the purpose statement here, is is right at the beginning. So if you look at, I know they were just read, but let's look at these again. We're going to focus on verse 7, but verse 2 says, to know wisdom and instruction. So this is the reason why uh, this book was written, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple. So that's one group of people, knowledge and discretion to the youth. There's another group of people, the youth, the simple. Verse 5, let the wise, there's a third group, the wise hear and increase in learning. And the one who understands, that's a fourth group uh, of people, obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. So four groups of people, the simple, the youth, the wise, and the one who understands. Basically, uh, it's written for people who need wisdom 
and those who continue to need wisdom, even though they might be considered wiser than others. So really, it's intended for, for everyone. And not just people back then, but this book is intended for us today. The purpose, you could sum it up by saying that the purpose is to provide wisdom for living. A couple of things about Proverbs that we find in the book of Proverbs. First of all, it's important to remember or know that a proverb isn't really a promise. You know, there are a lot of examples we could use to show this. One is Proverbs 22, verse 6, which says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, that's not a promise. It's not a promise or a guarantee that if you follow the right formula later on when your child becomes old, that they will follow the Lord. Now, it's a general principle, and it's more likely to happen if you do train up the child in the way he or she should go, but it's not a, a promise or a guarantee. You know, we know that of, of proverbs that we use in our everyday language, English proverbs. Uh, one of those that I sometimes quote is, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. You know, don't just look for other things. Maybe the thing you have, like a job uh, offer, maybe you should take that one now instead of waiting for something better down the road. But sometimes, you know, it's good to, to wait and uh, wait for the better offer. So it's not a promise if you take the first opportunity or just keep what you have that you'll be better off down the road. Uh, maybe it's a general principle, but it's not a guarantee. So Proverbs are not, are not promises or, or guarantees. Uh, the second thing we need to know about a proverb is that a proverb isn't a rule. And that becomes clear when a proverb seems to contradict another proverb. Uh, the most famous example of this is the proverbs we find in chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. Verse 4 says, Answer not a fool according to his folly. And the next verse says, answer a fool according to his folly. So these aren't rules because they're saying the opposite thing. So what these two proverbs are telling us is that sometimes it's wise to ignore a fool, but other times it's best to correct a fool. It just depends on the situation. Uh, maybe if if there are other more impressionable people uh, present, maybe you want to correct that person who says something foolish or something accord, uh, that uh, goes against God's word. Other times you might feel it's just best to ignore the person. So they seem to contradict each other, but really uh, it depends on the situation. So they're not, not rules necessarily to follow. You might find some rules in Proverbs, but for the most part, uh, they're, they're guidance guiding principles or, or wisdom for specific uh, types of situation, and you need to uh, look at, you know, what, what would be best to answer the fool or to not answer the fool. Uh, you know, similar things in, we see in English Proverbs. You know, we sometimes say many hands make light work, but we also say too many cooks spoil the broth. So, you know, sometimes it's good. You have a project to have lots of people to help out, but other times, people can just get in the way or, you know, not really contribute much and maybe make things worse. So sometimes it's better just to have two or three people doing that job. So it depends on the situation. So a proverb really isn't a rule. But let's get back to those, those three questions. First question was, what is wisdom according to the book of Proverbs. As I already mentioned, there's a, there's a big difference between being smart and being wise. A lot of people are smart and foolish. Now here are a few ways wisdom has been defined. One writer defines it as capability in life. You could describe wisdom as the ability to make good decisions based on knowledge. A similar definition would be applied 
knowledge, taking what you know and applying it to life, decisions, choices, actions, words you say. Uh, in Exodus 28.3, where it talks about those who were skilled or skillful uh, to uh, make the uh, items for the tabernacle. It's actually the same word in the Hebrew as the word for wisdom. Skill and wisdom are, are translated from the same Hebrew word, which, which tells us that wisdom has something to do with skill. So it's not just knowledge, it's, it's applied knowledge, it's skill. Uh, from the ESV Study Bible, there's a good, I like this uh, definition of biblical wisdom, godly wisdom, skill in the art of godly living. Skill in the art of godly living. I like that one. So wisdom according to the book of Proverbs, we could say, I'm going to say, is skillful living. It's applying what we know what we know about God, about this world, what he's told us, and applying that to situations in life, skillful living. So again, having wisdom is more than just knowing the right things. It's doing the right things. Uh, the book of James is often described as the New Testament book of wisdom. And chapter 1, verse 22 of James says, Be doers of the word and not hearers of only. So having knowledge alone is not wisdom. Knowing God's word and all that it says, you could be the greatest scholar in biblical literature, but if you don't do the word of God, then you are not wise. So wise is skill in the art of godly living, skillful living. So not just knowing, but also doing. So that's wisdom according to the book of Proverbs. Secondly, what is the fear of the Lord? Now this is, this is something that is really tricky to, to explain or define. The fear of the Lord. To help us better understand the fear of the Lord, I want us to consider three verses in Proverbs that mention the fear of the Lord. And remember that this book is written in Hebrew poetry, and Hebrew poetry often has, has two lines, and the second line helps us to further understand the first line. So each of these verses contain or have two lines. So the first is the one we've already considered, chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So that second line helps us to understand what the fear of the Lord is or isn't. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the opposite of fearing the Lord is saying, you know, I know better than God. Or maybe the person doesn't even believe in the God of the Bible and just says, well, I know best how to live my life. Uh, fools despise wisdom and instruction. So that's the, the opposite of, of fearing the Lord, just despising God and his instruction. A uh, second verse is chapter 9, verse 10, which says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The knowledge of the Holy One is that's God, is insight. So to fear the Lord involves understanding who God is. So if we know who he is, we will fear him. Scripture tells us that God is, is good, that he's merciful and gracious. But it also tells us that he doesn't tolerate evil. And I read one commentator who said something like, the fear of the Lord is, is less than terror, but, but more than reverence. We often refer to it as reverence, and I might do that here this morning. But as I said, it's tricky to nail down exactly what the fear of the Lord is. But it's, it's, it's less than being terrified by the Lord, but, but more than just reverencing him. He's a good God, but he's also a God who does not tolerate 
evil. We need to have knowledge of the Holy One. That is insight. And then the third verse is chapter 15, verse 33. 1533, the fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom, and humility comes before honor. So if we have the fear of the Lord, we understand that God is the creator and we are creatures. He is God and we are not. And we recognize our dependence on God, that we are really insignificant in comparison to him. And so with that comes humility. And so you could add all of those things together to to start to understand what the fear of the Lord is. You know, it's, it's submitting to God's instruction and wisdom, not saying I know better than God. It's it's having humility, recognizing who I am and who God is. It's it's understanding uh, that God is good but he doesn't overlook sin. Let me just give you a few, uh, few definitions of the fear of the Lord. As I said, there's probably no perfect way to sum it up, uh, but the fear of the Lord has been, has been described as worshiping submission, reverent obedience, and affectionate reverence. I'm going to use that third one as my definition or description of the fear of the Lord. It's not perfect, but the fear of the Lord is affectionate reverence for God. So there's fear involved there, awe, reverence, but also affection, love for God, knowing that he is good. Affectionate reverence for God. So the fear of the Lord consists of both reverence for God and love for God. If we have those things, then that will lead to obedience to God. Uh, Job, another book of wisdom, chapter 28, verse 28 says, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. So the fear of the Lord involves obedience to God's commands. Affectionate reverence. And then the third question was, how is the fear of the Lord the beginning of wisdom? Well, being wise must begin with the fear of the Lord. It's the starting point. It's foundational. When you, when you go to school, when you start in primary or grade one, do you learn algebra or calculus? No. What do you learn about math? Probably learn your numbers, one, two, three, and so on. You know, what they mean, how many is one, how many is two, and then you learn two plus two equals four. So what two plus two equals four is to doing calculus or algebra, the fear of the Lord is to having wisdom. You know, two plus two plus uh, equals four is foundational to doing all sorts of more difficult types of of math. Uh, But you never leave knowing your numbers or knowing 2 plus 2 equals 4 or your multiplication, subtraction, division. You always need that. And if you somehow forgot all of that, then you could never do calculus. So those basics are are fundamental or foundational to, to going on to do something more difficult. And so that's how it is with the fear of the Lord. It's, it's foundational. We really can't have wisdom without it. We start, that's the starting point, the fear of the Lord. And we continue to need the fear of the Lord if we're to continue to have wisdom, which is skillful living, uh, obeying the word of God in all sorts of different situations. So the fear of the Lord is foundational to being wise. It must come before wisdom, and we must not stray from it. You know, we could think of Solomon, the author of most of these Proverbs. He was known for his wisdom. 
Perhaps you've heard the expression, the wisdom of Solomon. He was a wise man, but he died a fool. And how could that be? One of his Proverbs says, this is chapter 19, verse 27, Cease to hear instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. So Solomon didn't listen to his own advice. Solomon lost his fear of the Lord. Wisdom, skillful living, spiritual success, it doesn't guarantee uh, wisdom tomorrow. So it's possible to lose the fear of the Lord. So the fear of the Lord is foundational, but we cannot stray from the fear of the Lord if we are to be wise, if we're to skillfully live this life as God wants it to be lived. In our pursuit of wisdom, uh, we're going to be surrounded by Others going in the opposite direction who will be encouraging us to do the same. You know, godly wisdom often doesn't line up with worldly wisdom. You know, people in the world often say, well, just follow your heart. But what does the word of God say? Sometimes our heart can deceive us. You think of baptism this morning. You know, committing ourselves to following Christ. Many people would say, well, just live your own life. Do what makes you happy. But according to God's word, that is not the wise path to take. And so, uh, this is especially applicable to the youth, which is one of the groups of people addressed in the book of Proverbs, but it applies to us all as we seek to live this life, in a wise way, we will have all sorts of people or voices or things said to us that will go against the pursuit of godly wisdom. And so it won't be easy, and we can lose the fear of the Lord, and we can become fools instead of wise. Uh, Jesus once said, Matthew 12, 42, the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. He's talking about himself. He's saying that he, Jesus, is greater, wiser than Solomon. I think about what this man who is wiser than Solomon did for us. Uh, look at the cross and see a wise man dying for fools. And if that doesn't produce within us the fear of the Lord, that I don't think anything will. At the cross, we look to Jesus and we see that God doesn't just overlook our sin. It must be paid for. Jesus died for the sins of the world. But it also shows us that he's a good God. He's a gracious God. He's a merciful God. And that, knowing that, should produce within us the fear of the Lord. An emotion that will lead us to want to obey God's word and want to apply the wisdom of the book of Proverbs to everyday situations. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do you have the fear of the Lord? Do you understand who the Lord is, who you are in comparison? Look to the cross and see Jesus, a wise man, dying for fools like us.